Well, good morning, everyone. Maybe we'll get started. And uh, really excited this morning. Uh, first of all, happy Monday. And sorry, it's such a gloomy <laughs> weekend and day. But uh, it is springtime, and there's a lot of excitement, I think, about, around where things are going. And I'm really excited to have Brian Ferguson here today. So Brian is a, a former Navy SEAL who I had the chance to see his keynote address at the uh, American College of Cardiology's uh, Cardiovascular Summit in February and was fortunate to get connected to Brian and was really struck by his talk and the energy around human performance. So just a little bit about Brian. Brian spent his career working in high performance organizations. He's learned from leaders and decision makers in US national security, the military and technology. And he's used those experiences to um, build Arena Labs, which is a company pioneering the field of high performance medicine. Uh, Arena Labs is on a mission to reimagine healthcare by treating doctors and nurses as elite performers. By investing in clinicians with the same training, tools, and technology that he used as a Navy SEAL uh, or that Olympic athletes use or creative uh, masters use, Arena Labs believes hospitals can reduce burnout and provide healthcare teams with the ability to flourish in the face of demanding, stressful careers. Brian's actually also a partner and co-founder of the Liminal Collective. It's a unique human performance-focused company enabling humans, humanity's boldest endeavors. Liminal is currently working in civilian space travel, deep sea exploration, and the digital future of cyberspace. Before founding Arena Labs and Luminal Collective, Brian actually served in the military as a Navy SEAL, as I mentioned. He was an officer and deployed in Afghanistan and various parts of the Middle East. Aside from those duties on the tactical level, he worked with senior leaders to understand the impact of accelerating technology on the modern battlefield. He built and directed the first innovation cell in undersea special ops focused on human performance and emerging technology. It was very fascinating to hear about last night in more detail. Uh, prior to joining the military, he was a pre presidential appointee in the Office of the Secretary of Defense and actually has worked in the White House. Brian serves on the faculty of Singularity University in Silicon Valley. He's working with Fortune 500 leaders on challenges related to exponential technology and change. He also co-chairs the Limits of Human Performance Symposia at the Santa Fe Institute on Complexity and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He received a Master of Science from the London uh, School of Economics and speaks intermediate Persian and Farsi. Other than that, he doesn't do much at all. <laughs> <laughs> You're embarrassing me, Brian. <laughs> Brian serves on the boards of Alder, C-Track, and the Honor Foundation. He lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and is most proud of being father to his three-year-old daughter, Wynn and Valentine. So, um, also, thank you to our sponsors today, Jansen, uh, Pulmonary Hypertension, and Zoll LifeFest. And thanks to Chris and Scott and Maya for getting Brian here. So, Brian, take it away. Thank you. So as uh, I grew up in a home, I'll tell a, a little bit about my mom in a minute, but my mom was really big. She was one of nine, Irish Catholic family, and really big on humility. So anytime I hear that bio, it's very cringeworthy for me. It's long, so forgive that. But, you know, at a basic level, if you ask, like, my, just my passion in the world and what I've been privileged to do is get to serve in different ways. And I'm, I'm deeply passionate about the capacity of the human being to live the best arc of what we're capable of in the world. And I think performance, a lot of time we hear human performance, and we immediately drop into thinking about sports or Navy SEALs. And for me, it's really how do we access the best version of ourselves? And I see this a lot in healthcare, of the, the demands and the duties here versus who we are at home or out in the world. And, and for me, the question is, how do we better balance both of those? Um, you, you know, there, there's a number of, I will say one of the things last night, we had an amazing dinner. And actually, before I start, I, I should also mention, I get to do this a lot. And it's increasingly a privilege for me. I'm going to talk in a minute about my own background in healthcare. Um, but of all the institutions I've been to, I mean this sincerely, there's never been one that has been more professional and welcoming as a guest when you come in and, and just all the details and, the, and had an amazing dinner last night. So I just really appreciate the, I'm, I'm sure there are days for all of you where it doesn't feel that way, but, but as a visitor, thank you very much for being so gracious and Maya, especially for all the details. Um, one other interesting connection here. So I'm gonna in a minute talk about this idea of how, what are the tools we can use to navigate for ourselves a better version of who we wanna be as clinicians in our home life. And so for a long time, when, when we first started Arena, and I'll tell the backstory, uh, we were, I had stumbled into working with the Cleveland Clinic. And so one day was working with a group of residents, and the, the head of the residency program is a, a, a Dr. Doug Johnston. And so Dr. Johnston was running an oral board on a coming off pump scenario with, uh, I think at the time, 12 of their residents. And so it was a traditional, for those of you who've been, I, for me it was the first time I'd seen something like that. 
Um, but we were teaching at the time the tools to manage stress as, as we feel ourselves sort of coming apart cognitively when we're anxious and nervous. And as you can imagine, for a resident in front of a, a senior attending, mo most of these folks were very nervous. And so in this coming off pump scenario, I was, you know, they, the, the question was, you know, increasingly challenging of, of the scenario. And I watched 11 of 12 residents literally melt down. And, and, and now, in a way, that was the point, to see at what point in this scenario do you not have the knowledge and can you not think through. But one particular resident, I watched him, there was something going on in his head, and he was anxious, but I could see him controlling his breathing. I could see him moving through a different set of, of sequences. And at the end, he was the only person that passed the scenario. And so I pulled him aside and I said, hey, what was going on there? One of his colleagues, literally by the end, was in a ball like this. Right, which I'm, you know, th th there's there's a whole discussion we're going to have about what's going on there, but I, I said, what what are you doing? So you know, early in my residency, I was really struggling, and I was pulled aside, and I was told that I, I needed to, to fix some things, and I realized that my anxiety was making it challenging for me to come into some of these cases. So every morning, I started a visualization practice, and it turns out by the end of his residency, this particular resident was one of the highest performers in in this in his pool. And it turns out that, that resident is Dr. Bobby Steffen, who's here now. And so I, I asked him if I could share that story today. Um, but Bobby had, you know, some things we're going to talk about, like these tools we know work when we, when we think about and we can zoom out and say, what is it? Because all of us face stress and pressure. The difference is some of us figure out how to deal with it, and others just kind of continue to row in the face of, of the headwinds of whether it's the broader challenges of today's world or, or being a clinician. So let me drop into my story here. Make sure that we get this frozen. There we go. So the namesake of our company, has anyone heard this quote from Teddy Roosevelt or familiar with the man in the arena quote? You want to give me a quick, your summary of it? I mean, basically, it's you don't really know what someone's going through until you really ask that person. Yeah. So President Roosevelt, 1910, gives this. So this, this quote has been more popularized in today's society. LeBron James writes, man in the arena on his shoes. A woman named Brene Brown. Has anyone read any Brene Brown stuff or familiar? So her, her book, Daring Greatly, is based on this quote. It, but it's come up a lot more in sort of the zeitgeist of pop culture. But Roosevelt gives this speech in 1910 to 200 French elites in France at the University of Sorbonne. And he has just been president of the United States. And he's saying, look, the fact that you've been successful and that you are leaders in society doesn't give you the right to be on the sidelines. Any society, the title of the speech is citizenship in a republic. But what he's arguing is for any society to flourish, it's the people who are engaged in the hard work of building and running a society that really are, are, are at the end of the day, the man and or woman in the arena that make a society flourish. And so just indulge me. There are many men and women who confine themselves to criticism of the way others do what they themselves dare not even attempt. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man or woman who is actually in the arena. And that's all of you here today. And at a minimum, if we zoom out, I was telling Dr. Newell this at the front end, I think one of the, one of the fascinating elements of the last two years is for the first time in modern American society, people begin to understand the load that all of you carry. And I don't mean to be melodramatic or to patronize you. But, but that is the reality, is that when you think about, and, and interesting, the parallel to special operations of, of two wars, you had a small group of people for society stewarding that. And now we're seeing the same thing happen in healthcare. And so for all of you in the arena, right, our, our work at Arena Labs is a laboratory of people who come from high pressure, high consequence backgrounds to work as partners with frontline medicine. Now, I've been fortunate, a lot of my life has been around this question, is what can we learn from the best teams in the world? Whether we're talking about the military, People doing bold human endeavors like a skydive from space, the creative arts, trying to, anyone familiar with the Nike Breaking 2? This was an, an yeah, Elliot Kipchoge, are you a runner? Yeah, so this was an effort to break a, a two hour marathon. So to run a marathon in two hours, you have to run a four minute and 33 second pace for 26 miles, which I'm, I'm lucky to maybe get halfway around a track at that pace, maybe, I don't know, nuts. Anyways, fascinating and, and inspiring. So I'd ask all of you to consider this. Two paradigms in the world. One is an endurance paradigm. So in an endurance paradigm, whatever our career, but think of for, for all of you as clinicians, you have your energy output over time. And this time could be COVID, it could be the long arc of your career, it could just be a rough month. 
But every stressor that hits us, it depletes our energy a little bit. And even, even if we're managing it our best, we're doing our best to stay afloat, over time, the question is, how long can I go? I think a lot of us in this room are probably in, a, in some degree of an endurance paradigm. I'm going to come back. Now, now, to be clear, endurance is the bedrock of extraordinary human, uh, ex extraordinary human endeavor, so it is an important strategy. But in a performance paradigm, same idea. Now, every time we have a stressor, it is, of course, going to deplete our energy. But when we have tools, and the tools in our toolkit, to understand how do, how do we go through hormesis and actually grow from that stressor. Over time, the question is not how long can I go, but how good can I get? Not just for my patients, not just for my team, but for my, myself and for my family. And that's at the end of the day what we're after when we talk about high performance medicine. But I want to start with what we call the sacred world of medicine. So anyone in here familiar with this photo? I know Dr. Newell's seen it, but anybody else that hasn't heard this story? Joao, see you nodding. Do you, know, do you know the backstory on it? Or rough backstory? Rough. Anyone take a, take a guess? Uh, or, or obviously somebody that is extremely exhausted and you know, the burnout uh, you know, picture that typically gets associated with that. Yep. Of work. And it's why I love this photo because it is emblematic of, of the work here. So this is the 1987 National Geographic photo of the year. It's become one of my favorite photos. So. Dr. Religa, pictured here, is a Polish surgeon who studied in the States and went back to Poland. And think about 1987 before the wall came down, so we're still talking about a very Cold War era. And at that time, that, so this was advanced technology in 1987, but this procedure was said to be impossible. So much so that Dr. Religa had to go to the black market to raise money because it was sacrosanct in Poland to take a, a Catholic country to take one human heart and put it in another. So this procedure takes 23 hours. And you look at the nurse in the back right-hand corner, collapse and exhaustion. And if you look at Dr. Religa, from the shoulders down, his body posture is clearly exhausted. But when you look at his eyes, it's like he's willing that patient alive. And we call this the inspired soul. And all of us do, particularly when we come into medicine, we're typically service archetypes. You're doing this because you want to do hard things in the world. You want to save lives and, and, and somehow impact society at scale. And it's incredibly powerful because it allows us to transcend what we're capable of. So this patient went on to outlive Dr. Religa. Extraordinary story. But the, the, this idea of the sacred world of medicine is really, it's at the bedrock of what we do and what, I, what I'm so passionate about. This little dude who could use a meal is me about 25 years ago. As I mentioned, I grew up in the Midwest in Cleveland, Ohio. This is shadowing an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and we can save our jokes about orthopedic surgery for later. But at the time, I was really inspired to go into medicine. And the reason is this woman on the left. That's my mom. And you can see her just beaming. Right? Talk about the inspired soul service archetype. She loved what she did. This is actually, I live in Nashville, Tennessee now. A hipster would pay a lot of money for my dad's pleather coat. <laughs> <laughs> but the photo on the right is literally my family dining room table. And I had vivid memories as a kid. We were fortunate most nights when it was feasible to eat dinner together. And I have vivid memories going back to this idea of a service archetype. My mom cared so much about what she did. On the rare days she lost a patient or something went wrong in the OR or things didn't go well, I could viscerally feel that as a little guy. And I always kind of wondered, right? What, like I, I was fascinated she cared so much, but it, it, it never came together for me. And instead, rather than going to medicine, I had the privilege, as Dr. Newell mentioned, to go into the military and national security. So I initially was a civilian working in the White House and the Pentagon, and then I went into uniform and had the privilege of serving as a Navy SEAL. But the first thing you have to learn as a Navy SEAL is what am I afraid of and how do I manage fear and anxiety? Because in order to do any increasingly high pressure mission, I've got to be able to control my own physiology and my own internal landscape. Fundamentally changed my life and was profound. But my last job in the SEAL teams was working in our undersea clandestine operations unit. So based out of Hawaii, these are mini submersibles. So these launch off of a bigger submarine. And the guys that are doing these missions are often in mission sets anywhere from six to 12 hours. And you see the bubbles coming out of the top there and you see that diver that, you know, when you're breathing mixed gas for anyone who's a scuba diver, you, you obviously can't hydrate, drink fluids, you can't eat. And most of the time, this photo was taken off the coast of Hawaii during the day, so it's blue water. And you can see most of the time these missions are at night, so total darkness. So no food, no hydration, no spatial awareness. It's a really challenging human performance problem. 
And so my last job in special operations when I was leaving was building the first undersea special operations innovation cell that was particularly focused on how do we think about human performance in a new way? How do we work with the best units and teams and organizations in the world to think about human performance in this, this SEAL operator in a really challenging environment? And so I got to work in really amazing places and learn from, anyone been to a Cirque du Soleil show? And so you think about a high stakes, high consequence environment. There's an amazing amount that goes into preparing these performers to do this night in and night out. There's a, an infamous, I mentioned earlier, the Red Bull skydive from space called Stratos. So Felix Baumgartner, an Austrian skydiver, trained for five years to take a hydrogen balloon into the stratosphere and literally jump back to Earth. Became the first human to break the sound barrier. But there's a lot that we learned about the psychology and the physiology of extreme human performance that then can be democratized back down to you know, more basic levels. But I ended up in your world of cardiac care. And I ended up at the Cleveland Clinic Heart and Vascular Institute. This is Doug Johnson, who I mentioned earlier. And so what fascinated me when I, the first time I was in the OR and cath lab and, and just clinical spaces of cardiac care, and in general in frontline medicine, is how similar it was to the world of special operations in these other environments. Small teams, highly interdependent, everyone is mission driven back to this idea of the sacred world of medicine and service archetypes. It's increasingly complex and dynamic because of what modern technology demands of us, but ultimately it's a high consequence, no fail environment. And so when something is high consequence and no fail, the subtext of that is it's stressful. Now, what was interesting to me is all these other professions that I've been able to learn from or serve within, whether that was fighter pilots or Olympic athletes, there was this focus in training for high consequence, no fail environments. And that was knowing oneself through data. Right? How do I learn about my own pattern of life so that I can be smarter in understanding things like rest and recovery? Understanding how to manage and adapt to stress through the right tools. I mentioned Dr. <laughs> Stefan earlier, and it's something like visualization. But ultimately, how do, I, how do I optimize my own performance through my recovery cycles? And so all of these other professions, there was a technical skill that had to be acquired, but there was also an understanding of oneself to be a better teammate. And so when I ended up in your, the, the deeper I got into your world, what fascinated me is none of that discussion was happening in medicine, for the most part. There was very often... A, you know, the, a radical focus on technical skill because it is so difficult to become a cardiologist or to work in this space, but the, the human factors and the human performance was never focused on. And that became for us this mission of high performance medicine. And the provocative question we ask is, what if we would provide you on the front lines of cardiac care with the same tools, training, and data that we give to the world's top performers, whether they're Olympic athletes, Navy SEALs, or creative performers. And to be clear, performance is not pushing someone to, to work more efficiently or work harder or longer. It's actually how do we flourish individually? So when we do show up, we are the best version of ourselves, clinically and as leaders. So this is one of my favorite photos of the last two years. And this, before COVID, I've been doing this about six years now, was always fascinating to me because this was the, the mantra that governed much of your world. And again, as I said earlier, to be clear, not advocating nap rooms and people taking as much time off as they want. Like being in frontline medicine, you've all chosen by virtue of being service archetypes, you wanted to go into a field that was hard and demanding. And as I said earlier, the bedrock of all extraordinary human achievement is people who are able to endure. But endurance is a long-term strategy doesn't work out. And we, we've learned that the hard way in other fields. So we saw this play out recently in Olympic sport. There's a lot of stories, but Simone Biles is a great example of the pressures, the increasing pressures, particularly in the, on, in a, on the modern stage when the confluence of technology and, and expectations. Not to be melodramatic, but this is very much what I saw in the last 20 years in the military. It was not often the battlefield that was a more existential threat. It was people who weren't able to manage the challenges of the battlefield and coming home to their families and how to manage the stressors and everything that had gone on. Now I mentioned we started with the inspired soul and the service archetype. And what I find is that people who, again, want to do hard things, serve the world and impact lives. All of us who are service archetypes, whether we're on the front lines as teachers, as frontline clinicians, in the military soldiers, we will give of ourselves and give of ourselves and give of ourselves to that mission until there's nothing left to give. 
And if we don't have an institutional architecture and tools in place to protect against the better angels of our nature, that endurance strategy, we will keep going and going. And so the question is, how do we protect against that? Now we go back, the good news is, this problem isn't unique to medicine. And I think a lot of times when we talk about burnout, we think that it's just unique and endemic to our own institution, our own field. So when I was in the military, this was an early mentor of mine who helped me begin to understand this. This is Dr. Kirk Parsley. So Kirk had actually been a SEAL, went back to medical school. And so when I was at SEAL Team 7, he was stationed on the West Coast overseeing all of the SEAL teams there. And what Kirk was particularly interested in, in about 2008, we started to see really high rates of problems around what people would call PTSD, but it was precursors to PTSD. It was people who weren't sleeping well, a lot of males who had endocrine dysfunction, issues with testosterone, and Kirk started to study that in depth for 10 years. And so in 2020, he published in the International Journal of Psychiatry and Medicine this, this article on operator syndrome, which is what he came to call this issue. Now indulge me again, but operator syndrome may be understood as the natural consequences of an extraordinarily high allostatic load. The accumulation of physiological neural and neural endocrine responses resulting from the prolonged chronic stress and physical demands of a career we could cross out with military special operations and we could put on the front lines of healthcare, I would argue. And what he started to see is again endocrine dysfunction, which had this cascading effect around people who had tr trouble sleeping because of the nature of you know, being in body armor and moving around, a lot of orthopedic problems, very similar to standing all day and looking over a table or looking at imaging. But ultimately this cascaded down into relational problems, right? Because as we know, when, when the endocrine system isn't working, we're not sleeping as well, that spills over into the rest of our lives. So the question is, what do we do when we can't make our careers less stressful? Because again, I think if your career wasn't stressful, most of you wouldn't enjoy it. That's the reason we come in to solve hard problems and do hard things. <clears throat> But this is where Kirk be, was one of many leaders in special operations who started to look at this performance paradigm to say, how do we give people tools and understanding so the stressors of deployment, the stressors that, that are the reality of modern special operations are helping people to grow over the long arc of a 20 year career. So at the end, they feel like they've flourished and they haven't just endured and survived. So one of the things that happened when I was early on in training, this is not to glorify military imagery, but the photo on the right is a very high stakes training event we do called close quarters combat. So a small group of people moving together in a, in a structure that is unknown. So you're having to navigate in and out of rooms where you don't know what's gonna be on the other side of a door. It requires a very high sense of self-awareness and self-control, but communication in a team. And what Kirk started to do was put sensors. I had to wear a sensor, not just for those high stakes training evolutions, but to see how they affected my weekend and how they spilled over into the evening. And I began to make a connection, not just between training, but the reality that I couldn't decouple the stressors of a demanding career from my life away from, from training and operating. And for me, it began, it was fascinating to start to see through data how I could be more self-aware of a, a high stress moment and the way it impacted my weekend, or the inverse of when I used the right tools, how it started to make me feel more, more rested and relaxed. And so at a basic level, the question I've started to ask over the last six years is, why don't we take all of the skill sets and tools that we use like that in special operations or in the creative arts and bring it into your worlds on the front line of medicine? And so in a minute, I wanna, I'm gonna start to go into some data and how we think about this, but I wanna just pause for a minute. Any questions in the room? How does this sound to you guys? Spot on? Okay, good. So the question is, what do we do about it? And how do we make this? Because I think when we, we anchor in the negative narrative that you're all broken and you're burned out, the, it's human nature to want to step back from that. It's very much like in the military when you talk about PTSD. Even though it is a very serious problem and it might be spot on, if we present it in a negative narrative, it is natural for us to, to be a little bit skeptical. And so when we, we frame through the positive and the aspirational narrative of performance and how do we flourish as individuals and how do we give ourselves a sense of agency, it starts to change that narrative. So we happen to partner with one sensor called Whoop. Anybody in here wear a Whoop? You did, yeah. And so, so Whoop is, it's like Aura Rings. I know a lot of Apple watches tend to be a little more ubiquitous in healthcare. But these sensors are just meant to get some baseline data. They're not meant to track you, but how do we again start to give you that, that data? And so when we have clinicians wear this in conjunction with other tools that we're teaching, we start to learn some really interesting things. And this is gonna get back to, okay, what do we do with tools? And how do we start to reverse engineer this so it doesn't feel like a hopeless problem? 
So this is data we collected at the end of last year from 30 hospitalists. Now, admittedly, this was over 90 days. And so this is not yet statistically significant in, in terms of what we've published, but I just want to give you a sense of how we think about what we can learn here. So in this particular group of hospitalists, what we see is that those who work more than three days in a row, by the fourth day, we see a huge drop in sleep efficiency meaning they're not getting slow waves. So we consider sleep efficiency, your total time in bed, well, let's say you're in bed for six hours, how much of that time is spent in REM sleep, rapid eye movement, and slow wave sleep? Because we know those are the two stages where we move through the day's emotional stress from before, and we're actually restoring ourselves in, in neurologically and just physically. What happens is when people when we're less efficient with our sleep and we're not getting that recovery, the next day we typically see elevated heart rates, lower heart rate variability, and we see in a minute, I'll show you in the data, that people report feeling more stress because our propensity to feel stress is heightened when we don't actually get good rest and recovery. Now, <clears throat> the reason that we, what, you know, when we start to posit what's going on here, what we've seen in other fields is that if I'm working three days in a row, particularly in the environment of COVID, and I go into that fourth day, I'm stuck in sympathetic state. So my body has become accustomed to the frenetic nature of the hospital. And there's so many inputs, I'm moving around, I've got demands for my team, et cetera. It's hard when I go to bed to move into parasympathetic state and turn off, like, just like that break in our autonomic nervous system. And so if we don't have the tools to turn off, it gets really hard to sleep. And as you can imagine, this only gets worse as we go into more days. Now, to be very clear, the point here is not to work four days in a row, because the realities, we were talking about this last night at dinner, the realities of today's human capital landscape is that there's more demands on us. The question is, how do we give you some tools in here that allow you to feel agency so you can actually, on days two and three, as an example, do some breathing exercises to move into parasympathetic state throughout the day, so by the time you go to bed, you can more easily fall asleep. Now, interestingly, this is, you know, our, our work is not just about sleep, but what I find is where, where this data starts to get really interesting, so we now have about 8,000 nights collected on perioperative teams, but, but particularly in cardiac care. So one of the things that we see here, is, and this, is, this data is not particularly prolific, but once you collect it, you can start to see that in cardiac surgeons, generally speaking, if not on call, Saturdays and Sundays is where people are the most rested. So Obviously, by Sunday, 7.6 hours of sleep in bed. And then there's a cliff Monday, and throughout the week, there's a linear degradation. Interestingly, when we look at residents, that cliff tends to be more intense. But we're, now, when we map sleep in this idea of rest and regeneration, this is, this is in resident populations against stress, it maps very clearly that it, throughout the week, when we get into Thursday and Friday, people are reporting the most stress. Not only are they reporting the most stress, but they're less focused, they report less clinical acumen, and worse team dynamics. Now again, this is not just about sleep, but the question is what tools do we use so that our sleep can be more efficient, and we can buttress in some ways the realities and the stressors of your work, and particularly in the, in clinically. So when we start to talk about this idea of moving into a high-performing culture, the bedrock in a minute, I'm gonna show you some videos, but I think one of the things we have to step away from, because there's actually a lot of amazing opportunity, what we have to do is move into the micro, not the macro. Because what, one of the things we were talking about last night at dinner, you know, even when I, when I went through the problem set, you could in this room feel the energy go down as people like, well, shit, this is intense. Because this is what I do for a living, and I'm looking at my own data. And it's human nature to feel heavy that way. This is, this is actually an aspirational narrative. But what's important is that most of the time we look at the macro. And so we want to figure out what's something we can do for everybody that, you know, we're going to buy a meditation app for our entire staff. The problem is when we focus on the macro, we miss the micro, the individual. And many times in healthcare, by nature of keeping the doors open, we focus on macroeconomics or macro efficiencies, throughput, turnover times, et cetera. But the reality is this room is made up of a group of micro personalities that what works for me is different than you. And so that's a huge part of thinking about when we start to get into the solutions here, how do we get to the individual level? And then reimagining patient safety. I said this last night, I'm intentionally being provocative, but the least important part of patient safety is the patient. The least important part of patient safety is the patient. And I say this with all due respect, 
But what is, when we're focused obsessively on an exogenous variable, and we're continually worried about patient safety and quality and outcomes, and it's at the expense of ourselves, if we're not taking care of the actual system that's providing care, we know over time is that system is going to continue to degrade. And this is very similar to the military. One of the shifts we had to make as an example, if you think about a hostage rescue scenario, of course everybody is focused on that, saving that person. But we know that the only way we're going to have success in that mission is everybody shows up the best version of themselves. And then lastly, before as leaders, before we can lead under pressure, we have to understand our own physiology. We had some interesting discussions last night at dinner of like, how do we navigate the stressors of all the demands in our environment, home life and family? If we're going to be great leaders, it's about first investing in ourselves. So one of the things that, that we also learned is that when we think as leaders in this room or across the space, the challenge I mentioned Dr. Stefan earlier, we loved running those workshops on visualization or on breathing or teaching some of these tools. The problem is that your world is the ultimate herding cats experience. Because clinical schedules shift, OR schedules shift, et cetera, it's very hard to get people in a room except for a grand rounds maybe once a week. And so we had to, how do we start to meet people where they're at to give them a sense of agency so, they can, so that all of you can do this work on your own time? Because the other thing that's interesting about this that I often talk about, whether we're talking about the military, the creative arts, or sports, most of those fields spend, let's call it 95% of their time training. When I was in the military, I was lucky if 1% of my time was actually doing missions at best. Very similar to what we see in sports and people you know, who fly planes. But in, in your world, you spend probably 95% of your time doing some version of your clinical duties. And that 5% of time that you have to train is usually dedicated to mandated training. Often you know, hand washing videos, these things that are important but are not necessarily how you want to spend that 5% of your time. And so the question is, how do we give you something on your own time to begin this bedrock of understanding physiology, stress, and performance? And so that was, the, the, at the end of the day, this is a big part of what we've attempted to pursue. But we do this, again, performance is about flourishing. And my argument is most of the time we focus, we start over here with leaders, or we want to fix our teams. But until individually we teach people, how do we, I become self-aware? How do I understand my own internal landscape we call interoception? which is what makes me stressed? What days of the week am I the most stressed? When do I feel the most regenerated? And then we combine that with how to manage energy and how to be adaptive in an environment that's constantly changing. This is incredibly powerful because if we do the micro really well, in the aggregate, it becomes our macro culture. And so at the end of the day, we combine this idea of a sensor. This is anonymized, so this is not about tracking individual data. But actually, you know, we were talking about last night at dinner, what fascinates me is that in your world, you are better than anyone at obsessing about the micro details on your patients. But when it comes to yourself, no one wants to actually look at their own data, which is just a fascinating psychological phenomenon of what, what, again, what is it that allows me to flourish and what days of the week can I flourish? And then if we can coach against that, again, the things that we know you may need to work on versus me, that becomes incredibly powerful. But one of the things I'm gonna show some videos we're talking about last night, this is a, a daily check-in we push. And what we found is that clinicians who do this day in and day out answer three questions. How stressed are you? How do you feel you can cope with that stress, meaning tools? What tools do you have and need? And how focused are you? When you do this, this small amount of data longitudinally every day, it actually creates that interoception. Because as people, we are actually, we're talking to a CVICU nurse at Vanderbilt uh, last week, and she was saying every day when she was pushing her focus all the way to the left, she started to realize how, how much trouble she was having focusing. And then we know where we start to apply tools. Rather than the institution saying, you're overwhelmed, we're going to give you, you know, that there's free yoga. Right? These things just don't allow us to drop into what we need individually. So if we go back to this, right, what tools do we use? And I want to just share two videos and then have a conversation. So back to this problem, as I mentioned, this is not about not working four days in a row. The question is, what do we do in days two and three that allow us to start feeling agency? So I'm going to show two videos. So this is Kristen Holmes. Kristen was the uh, she coached at Princeton University for 12 years and really reimagined that NC, you know, Division I sport, reimagined how they trained, again, through data and helping those individual female athletes understand themselves. She's now at one of our partners at WHOOP um, and is a PhD in physiology. But I, she's going to talk here about deactivation, and I just want to think about this concept of deactivation throughout the day. <laughs> 
most folks, folks who get into healthcare understand like what they're getting into. It's a high stress, high pace, demanding environment. And most people thrive in that environment, they love it. But where that um, high pace, high stress environment becomes negative is when we are in a constant state of hypervigilance or activation. And I think I, I see this in, you know, with our tactical athletes, um, and, I, and I definitely see it in, in healthcare, where we are in this hyper state of vigilance and we're, we, we're not necessarily deactivating, right? And I think the whole project here is about being able to have more control of your physiology, have more control of your autonomic nervous system, so you can really toggle between um, you know, hypervigilance and calm, right? And, and I think the, the place to start is really understanding your autonomic nervous system and how it functions. When you understand your autonomic nervous system, you can then start to exert more control over your behaviors that are gonna influence um, your heart's ability to respond um, appropriately to the demands of the autonomic nervous system. So I think there's a huge opportunity to, for people to really choose their level of performance if they can get a handle on how to have more control over their physiology. So obviously that's again not profound, but the question is then what do we do? And, and often th this idea of deactivating and, and allowing ourselves to drop in and be present, so back to the, the initial vignette I gave with Dr. Stefan, what's the tool I can use to allow myself to calm? And as leaders, I suspect most of the day, we had this discussion last night at dinner, you're, you're running through the day based on the demands of the institution and a higher architecture that doesn't allow you to feel sort of agency in your own time. So the next video I'm gonna show, this is the last one, is this is Dr. Andrew Huberman. Um, I know, a, a, anyone familiar with Dr. Huberman's work or listen to his podcast? So he's a neuroscientist at Stanford, an ophthalmologist. Most of his work, so I initially met him in, when I was in the military, so we did a lot of work with special operations. Very similar problem set, which is look, there's a lot of time when we just can't get good rest or good sleep. And the question is how do we optimize that rest and how do we optimize everything from cognition and decision making to this idea of deactivation. So his lab has done a lot of work in some of these very simple mechanisms that we can use throughout the day to move from sympathetic to parasympathetic state. So this is one called the physiological sigh. He's published a number of papers on this and, and the efficacy of just taking some breaths throughout the day and how it, the, the data will show that by the end of the day we are in a more parasympathetic state and can, can get better rest. So I'm gonna show this is a super basic mechanism that we teach but th this is where we start to talk about what tools work and how do we make this practical rather than feel overwhelming. The other real-time tool to de-stress quickly is probably the fastest way to do that, and it's something called the physiological sigh. The physiological sigh has been known about since the 1930s, but only recently do we really understand what the brain mechanisms are and how it really can be used to powerfully reduce stress. The physiological sigh is actually something that people do anytime they are in a claustrophobic environment and levels of carbon dioxide are increased in their bloodstream. We all also do this during sleep from time to time when we're not getting enough oxygen. A dog also does this before it goes down for a nap. The physiological sigh involves a double inhale and then an extended exhale. Now the double inhale can be done through the nose or the mouth and what it does is it inflates these little sacs that we have in our lungs called the alveoli of the lungs in order to maximally fill them with carbon dioxide that then we can release during the exhale. So as we're moving about through our day and just breathing normally and we're not conscious of our breathing, these little sacs in our lungs collapse. They literally collapse like a balloon at a kid's party. In order to reinflate them and to offload this carbon dioxide and reduce our stress, we have to inhale twice. <sighs> That double inhale, with the second inhale generally shorter than the other one, than the first, and then a long exhale allows you to offload the maximum amount of carbon dioxide. And so we've done measurements of this, other laboratories have done measurements of this. It's a remarkable way that you can engage conscious breathing and in just one or two of these physiological sighs. So inhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, inhale, exhale. The level of stress and level of alertness is brought down dramatically. And one note about that, the heart rate tends to follow about 10 to 30 seconds later. So if your heart's beating really, really fast and you're really stressed, if you can engage one of these physiological sighs, your stress level will come down immediately and your heart rate will come down about 10 to 15 seconds later. 
So this is perhaps the best and fastest way that people can de-stress. All the mechanisms, the circuits, the chemicals, and the compartments within the lungs and brain, they're all there right now. And all you have to do is engage this. And again, this is something that people and animals do reflexively, but it's something that you can do voluntarily anytime you want. For both inhale and... So, you know, just to, to kind of wrap it up here, I think I, I want to drop into a discussion, more importantly with all of you, but, you know, a, a lot of times you come into these discussions, it feels heavy. And there's a demand for this. I think one of the reasons this, this tends to resonate when I was at the ACC is because everyone feels some degree of this. And, and there's, there's two things I think that are a takeaway. One is that just coming out of the last two years, it's normal for a human system to feel a, an increased level of stress based on what you've been asked to do. And the other side of it that I'm really passionate about is that there are proven tools and there's, a, there's an entire field of science that helps us understand. The question is, how do we start to integrate these into our teams in a way that allows people, the same way we train technically, to train ourselves to, to feel more agency in the face of, of what is a daunting and demanding career? Um, but again, I'm super humbled to be here, really grateful. I want to have a discussion. We've got some time and drop into some questions, but, but thank you all very much. Thanks so much, Brian. What an amazing talk, and I just appreciate the aspirational nature of the work that you do, and um, you know, spinning that narrative, like you said, from sort of a negative PTSD type of narrative to a how do we control these uh, inherently stressful environments. And so, I'll open it up to the to the crew for questions. Any questions for Brian? One before we jump into question, I'm just curious who who in this room has a practice? Do any of you have sort of tools that you use to navigate performance stress your own your day to day? Your watch? Yeah. <laughs> I just got up from a good coffee, I think. Funny about this. But this is, uh, if I can ask, this yeah. is fascinating. I think most of us can relate to every slide you show. And the one thing uh, which I felt was the biggest difference is Navy SEALs served us on the athletes. The one thing is they're all young. And in medicine, as we get older, we are actually put into harder situations. So experience in medicine, of course, counts a lot, but you are still, you, you are in the front line more in harder situations with age mm -hmm. as you get older. So how do you deal with that, and have you studied that bit separately? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing I would, I would sort of respectfully push back on is that um, the veneer of youth in those fields is actually false. I mean, it, you know, the, the, the early trainees are young in, in special operations, but, but most leaders are, now, now again, I mean, I think young is a relative term, but, you know, in their 40s by the time they're, they're really responsible for major tactical decisions. Um, and, and the same, I think, you know, when you look at, you know, but I think with Olympic athletes, it's definitely a fair observation. Um, I, I think, though, it's one of the reasons there's an interesting, I, I often look at sort of the bifurcation between how do we train these things young? So one of my passions is, you know, going back to Dr. Stefan, like this should be taught in medical school and nursing school at, in a baseline. Because the first thing that you, as I mentioned, when you're in special operations, you start learning in boot camp these basic tools. Now, as you get more you know, sophisticated in your career, the tools change and that calculus change because now it's not just you know, in your space, you're, as you become more of an expert, you're, you now become a beacon for really challenging cases. But on top of it, you probably have a bigger team, more responsibility. So the sophistication of these tools changes, which is actually a great opportunity. For me, it makes, it begs the, it sort of makes the case for teaching these things younger so that people grow into them. Because my whole thing is that as a leader, and this was in the military, you know, I, I often, we were telling this story last night at dinner, if you melt down emotionally, right, that shows that you are not sophisticated in being able to navigate your stress. So by the time you become a leader, it should be table stakes that you understand how to manage your own stress. Now, of course, I'm being realistic. There's going to be days you feel stressed. But the question as a leader is, can you recognize it in the cath lab on someone on your team, a young technician or nurse? And that becomes the apotheosis or the highest version of performance in a leader. Can I see when someone comes in today and is a little bit off? And a little bit stressed. And that actually, because you have longer careers, it, it makes, I think it makes the case for extraordinary leaders in healthcare because you become an, a mentor and someone who's able to calm the room by virtue of your own presence. The runner. You got running shoes on too. <laughs> 
you. <laughs> it's it's actually an, a known thing that apparently there's a it's been named locally for the fact that I do this on occasion. But at any rate, <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you for an outstanding talk. I think you know I'm, I'm hesitant to say anecdote is evidence, but I guess the anecdote that I would offer is I see that sometimes the, the, what you describe I feel in performance athletes and in SEALs is that there's engagement in the mission. Mm -hmm. SEALs, obviously, there's engagement because if you're working as a team or not working as a team, it has the outcome of, of mortality for everyone who's involved in that team. And for performance athletes, they're engaged because that is what they're engaged to do. What I see oftentimes in healthcare is we fail, for, fail to engage in the mission and for the individuals. And I think that we as clinicians, oftentimes, when we're dealing with individual patients, we find that satisfying and rewarding and not draining stressfully it's the other crap you talk about mm -hmm. but we fail to engage in the mission and we and i think there's been a, a real challenge with that in healthcare over the past and is growing that yep. is, is a big part of engagement so i think there's the individual component but there's also the how do we engage in the mission yep how many how many of you in this room are proud of the work you do raise your hand yes the problem it depends right <laughs> well just in general though are you proud of what you do right everybody raise their hand how many of you articulate that mission to your team regularly in some way? I, I apologize, I don't, I, I'm, using, I'm going between doctor and first names here because I don't, we had dinner last night, but I'm gonna say Joao. So, so how do you do that? By, by recognizing the input to each one of them and acknowledging that and, and feedback, mm -hmm. you know, how much each contribution they make are important for the overall Product. Yeah. So this question came up last night at dinner, um, which is what's one of the bigger mistakes that I see happen in, in, in healthcare? Respectfully, um, to be very clear, special operations has a lot of brutal bureaucracy and downtime and mundane realities. And for every operator that goes in the field, we call it tooth to tail, there are seven support personnel. So the idea that like special operations are walking around just as this team of people who are all, no, there's a huge bureaucracy behind that. The difference is that there is always a reminder of the importance of the mission. I would argue the mission of healthcare, especially right now, is more inspiring and more profound and more viscerally real to the average American than special operations. But people in healthcare don't take the time to remind each other of the sacred nature of the work they do. And it doesn't have to be Pollyannish and cheesy, but there's some very basic ways to remind people, look, this is sacred work that we get to do. 99% of people in the world don't get to save lives every day. Again, that can sound corny if it's not done well, but when it's done right, it reminds people of the sacred responsibility we have. And there's gonna be days in any team, in a human system, where we show up and we're not at our best and we're, we're just, for some reason, we're personal or whatever. But when we have that environment to keep us honest and accountable, it's super profound. And it's one of the reasons I talk about, we talk about the first principles of high performance, ethos matters. And so ethos is Greek for character, but what is the character of the organization? And we can drop back into that in an inspiring way. That's actually what allows people to transcend what they're capable of. That's why I always start with that photo of Dr. Religa, the 1987 National Geographic Photo of the Year. That's the reason we're all here. We just forget about it. And the realities of having to do 15 minute sessions with our patients and 20 times a day and all the paperwork behind that, we can forget. Brian, very impressive, in, and I appreciate that you're expanding um, on what we started last night. Um, in, in continuing what you just described, um, at times we feel, and you made a point very clear, the micro is important, don't focus on the macro. Unfortunately, we have to also not lose the sight of the macro because we're gonna face it one way or the other. But I wonder if um, a mechanism for us to also not feel powerless or have some participation would be to create actually micro environments. So things that your small team have the capability of creating because once sense of engagement, participation, commitment comes in and sharing that, it's quite powerful. You might not feel so overwhelmed that you know you can conquer something. Yeah. Is that a mechanism of, of coping strategy that? I mean, 100%, I, I think we are all, I think more so than ever. Uh, there's one of my favorite books is a book called Tribe by Sebastian Younger, and he talks about, you know, at the end of the day, we are all tribal creatures, and we want to do work that matters, and we find meaning in community. 
And so when, we, when we're put into large, and, and to be clear, I, the macro matters. I'm not suggesting it doesn't. I, I'm, I'm, more argue, I'm arguing we need to balance more and understand the micro. But the, the nature of macro institutional economics and efficiencies, the larger that gets as these groups grow and our teams grow, it is natural that we lose the, the, the intimacy of that, that connection. And so figuring out how to create teams within teams is, and this is why I'm so passionate about leadership and why I get back to this idea of ethos. What is it that inspires me, you know, whether that's in the cath lab or day to day to make that team feel like where they're at really matters and it's powerful. We were talking last night. I mean, the other thing, there's this, there's this famous, um, this Alan Dunbar was an um, anthropologist at Oxford University. He came across what's called Dunbar's numbers. Anyone heard of this? So, so generally speaking, the prefrontal cortex from a relational management has the capacity to manage well 120 relationships. So this is why a company in the military is 120 people. But we get beyond 120, we just we lose that personal connection. And so you, you know, just coming to work here, you're in and out of this massive machinery. So how do we make that feel tribal? It's actually really powerful. Thanks, Brian. So question, all of this makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm a, what? what's that? What? <laughs> well, what I want to know is, so you're just going with the however. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was just a guy, I mean, I, I the, the, uh, the data speaks to me. What, how do you measure then success with your program? What, what does this look like on the outcome? We sleep more, sleep better? I mean, what does it all look like? Yeah, yeah, this is like the million dollar question, right? Um, so there's a, few, there's a few answers here. So, so one is, one of my passions that got me into this was again, five years ago, people were talking about burnout. And it was very similar to what I saw in the military in terms of the, the environmentals, the demands of, of you know, less and less people available, being asked to do more. Uh, but what was interesting to me is that for as much as every leader or institution I was in talked about burnout, the only measurements that they had, number one, there was never any agreed upon definition of what is burnout, back to the, sort of the operator syndrome paper. Two, the only way it was measured were self-reported annual surveys that had really low rates of completion. And by the way, if someone said they were burned out, that was an end state that's really hard to reverse engineer. So I became passionate about saying, well, why don't we put data upstream of that? Let's at least agree upon some, some markers that can help people understand where they're at in the moment in time. But burnout is a psychophysiological phenomenon. I don't say this as an absolute, but my, I have yet to see a hospital in the United States that is actually measuring, helping people understand their own psychology and physiology in an aspirational way. That again, is not like a, an anonymous reporting system for someone who's in a crisis. Those things matter, but again, that state, like how do we get upstream of that? So for us, I say, that without over-promising and under-delivering, three things we wanna do. One, let's create data that you all wish you had for yourselves and for your teams that you never did. Two, let's find basic trends and insights in that data. And then three, let's use that to better manage our human capital. And so that gets into some basic things like, not just you know, what days of the week are people most well-rested, what days do they report the highest levels of stress, highest levels of focus? And so that becomes, from a leadership, just like if you were running a sports team or a SEAL team, it's actually data that's not that profound, but no one has it, so we're operating in the blind. And if I was gonna ask you to, to, to manage patients that way, you would tell me you're crazy. But yet we think it's reasonable to manage our human systems that are providing patient care without any data. And so to be very clear, and I was telling Victor, again, sorry for first names, I was telling Victor this last night, my, my goal is that when we get enough data, we can start to be far more predictive and tie into patient quality outcomes. But right now, there is zero data that exists. And so it, to me, it's, it's a massive opportunity because it's not about, this is not about tracking people. This is about helping understand the individual pattern of life of clinicians so that we can help them better understand how to feel agency. And then again, in the aggregate, I really believe this starts to change the arc of healthcare. Because it does, you know, when we show up a little bit better each day, that marginal improvement compounded over time, I believe we can eventually show leads to better patient outcomes. Yeah. Hey, Brian, that's uh, just a really thought-provoking presentation. How long um, duration of data do you have from the longest running locations? And have you noticed trends? Because I think uh, we generally think if there's biofeedback and people know what's better, mm -hmm. they may actually start to change what they're doing. 
yep. um, be in step song on an Apple iPhone or whatnot. Yep. So, just curious. Yeah, so, so right now the, the longest, longest we have longitudinal data is six months. And what we find, so there's anecdotal and then the objective evidence. So sleep efficiency, we can definitely improve. Now what gets really hard is I'm, I'm gonna be honest, um, and when I say sleep efficiency, this is not changing how long you're sleeping, but how efficient is your sleep in those other stages. And so we see people who are engaged in our platform, and, and we measure engagement by our, so we ask five minutes a day. But people who check in at least five, five days a week, so they go on and they do that basic check-in I showed you. That again, the purpose of that is the accountability of just where am I at, and am I thinking about these tools. People who check in at least five days a week, when we look at what we call our demand resource evaluation score, which says how stressed are you versus how well do you feel like you can cope, meaning the tools. We see their DRES go up over time. And so DRES, again, suggests that I either perceive less stress or I have more tools. So that, the, the early indicators of, now this is people who are engaged in a platform. In a population, we generally see that level of engagement at about 70% in this particular clinical population. Uh, but that one of the things that we're really building, and this gets into actually where this stuff starts to tether into our personal lives, we spend more time than I, you know, I never thought I would be getting into things like UI, UX design, but like if most of you are hyper-engaged in this device, and your, your kids are, and your teams are, and so we're regularly, you know, our whole, the mantra of our platform is be binge-worthy with swagger. And what I mean by that is would you watch this content on Saturday on your day off? And if you feel like this is interesting enough to do, we can start to get you engaged in learning for yourself. And frankly, a lot of, the, a lot of these things that are taught in healthcare are often dry and conservative and stale because they, they're painted through this, the, the more negative narrative of burnout. And so as we get better at that and we see higher rates, so our, so our most recent population that we, uh, we launched three months ago, we're seeing higher levels of engagement. I just don't have that data yet on, on what, how it's gonna play out. Um, but it's ultimately for us, it's one of the reasons we built all this on a device. Because if, if I come run a workshop for you once a month, it doesn't have nearly the stickiness of a daily exercise that's getting you to check in and think about these things. So to be determined is the short answer. Ninjaworthy on Swagger, I love it. Yeah. So we have some questions from online? Yes, we do have one online question. First of all, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. And the question is, do you and how do you find patterns that are different between men and women physicians? Yeah, so, so we are increasingly getting into segmentation at that level. And it's again, it's the reason that, we, that I get excited about thinking about data at scale is we can start to segment, whether that's across gender, whether that's across specialty. Um, I don't... I don't have good data that I could that I could tell you off the cuff on on gender, um, but I definitely we definitely have good data on specialty, in particular nurses versus physicians. And one of the things that we find, and this is why the perform the narrative performance I find to be compelling, because once we get into performance is flourishing, that means different things to different people. In our nursing populations, we generally find people who are looking for some balance in their life and help staying afloat. So they're looking more for tools that are what we call in the transition space. How do I transition into my home life and feel like I can be present? We find often in our physician populations, I want to be more clinically effective or, or my, I want to improve my clinical acumen, ultimately my technical skill. And I'm looking for tools that can help me do that as a leader while still leading a team in, in an effective way so that, that it's more demands. But, but from a, a biomarker perspective, um, th this, is, this is where we're just starting to get now that we have more longitudinal data. But that's the exciting side for me. Mm -hmm. Well, we're at 8 o'clock. Brian, thanks so much for coming. Really appreciate you being yeah. here. It's, uh, again, aspirational work, very thought-provoking. And so we appreciate your time, and, and thanks for a great talk. Yeah, thank you all so much. Appreciate it. <laughs>